All right, so in this video, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the concept of the uh, phase diagram. <clears throat> uh, this is an example of a phase diagram on the page here. It looks rather complicated, but in reality, it's not. All the phase diagram is used for, and all it does, is show you the different phases that a particular um, species can be in, for example, carbon dioxide, and the boundaries between the three different phases um, that you can go between by changing the temperature and the pressure. Okay, so for example, for, for dry ice, for solid carbon dioxide, we have a solid phase that you will um, certainly have seen. We have a gas phase that you'll also certainly have seen, but there is another phase that you probably haven't seen before, and then a special phase up at the top here. I doubt many of you have seen liquid CO2, and it actually is obtainable uh, simply by varying the temperature and pressure to a certain degree. Uh, in fact, you can do this with things like water as well. I don't know if um, most of you know, but because, you know, water usually boils at 100 degrees C, and that's at one atmosphere pressure, but did you know that you can actually change the boiling point of water by changing the pressure that it's boiling at? Uh, you can do that. And you can also, um, well, anyway, anyway, so you can change the boiling point just by changing the pressure of um, the, the pressure of the water. And it's exactly the same for the dry ice. And to illustrate this um, formation of liquid CO2, because it's something that you guys probably haven't seen before, uh, I'm going to show a YouTube video, and I'm just going to sort of narrate over it. I'm having some sound issues going from here to um, anything on the internet, so I'm just going to narrate over the video and forego whatever their narration is. I'll just be saying the same thing, essentially. And then we'll come back and I'll talk to you a little bit more about this. Um, but this video is kind of cool, so take a look. So these guys are making liquid carbon dioxide, and they're starting off with a hunk of dry ice, the kind of stuff that you'll have seen before. Notice he's wearing gloves because um, you don't want to pick it up with your fingers, not if you like your fingers anyway, and he's smashing it up into pieces uh, with the intention of getting it into a relatively fine powder, because he's going to be bringing over here in a minute a, a, come on guy, bring it on over, a little plastic pipette, the kind of one that we've used in lab before. And notice he's snipping off the end there. What he's going to do is just to pack some of that solid dry ice into the bottom of that pipette. And then he's going to do a very makeshift version of sealing the to uh, sealing off the pipette. He isn't really going to seal it off, he's just going to um, crimp it shut with, uh, with a pair of needle nose pliers. This is a glass of warm water here in the background that he's going to pop the whole thing into. So he's, he's just talking right now about what he's trying to do to crimp it. Um, and it's not perfect, but it certainly is good enough. So what I said before was you increase the pressure and increase the temperature of your system. Um, the whole, because this is sealed, as the dry ice turns into a liquid, which you can actually see is happening right now. And notice what's happening to the size of the bulb here. It's growing, it's growing, it's growing, and eventually it burst, okay? Because you're increasing the pressure inside the container and notice what happened um, as soon as it burst. If we, if we just go back a minute, okay, so here we have a whole bunch of liquid that has formed, and what do you think this is due to? Why is this expanding? Well, there is a bunch of CO2 vapor up above here as well in equilibrium with the liquid. And there's probably a bit of solid in equilibrium here too. And because there is vapor up there exerting a lot of pressure with nowhere to go, eventually it's going to bust out of the um, pipette. And obviously that's what happens. And as soon as that burst, as soon as that pipette burst, look what happened to the CO2. It reformed back into a solid again. The simple reason for that is um, the pressure was instantly released. And so it went back to its original state. So that's that's kind of a cool thing. Anyway, let's get back to uh, the the phase diagram here. So <clears throat> phase diagrams exist for 
a vast uh, for a quite a large number of substances and these are things that people have um, studied the properties of and come up with they all have broadly similar shapes not exactly the same but broadly similar um, and they all can they all comprise of three main areas one where there's a gas phase one where there's a liquid phase and one where there is a solid phase we're going to get to this thing called a supercritical fluid here in just a minute the the idea behind this though this makes um, figuring out the question of well is this going to be a solid or a liquid when I'm when I heat it up to this temperature is it going to be a solid or liquid or a gas when I increase the pressure to this number of atmospheres um, it, it removes the necessity to um, know that specifically because you have the information here in this phase diagram you can just look at it and say for a particular temperature going from here to here and a particular pressure increase from here to here I know what my resultant phase is going to be and that's kind of a useful thing to have okay so I talked about the different regions but let's also talk about the lines here the boundaries between the different phases because these boundaries are kind of important so the boundaries or lines or whatever you want to call them represent the temperature and pressure conditions so when my temperature and pressure are such that I can plot a line like so because remember these um, diagrams were, were were developed by people just plotting different temperatures and pressures and getting lines like this so when my pressure and temperature exist um, to give me a plot like so like this first portion of the line here this means I have both solid and gas so my solid and gas exist in equilibrium with each other at that point now when I start to go up here um, there's no more gas present and now my solid and my liquid are in equilibrium with each other and that's and that's um, uh, obviously not the same as what we had here when we go along this point we now have an equilibrium between the liquid and the gas okay and that actually means something kind of important because if if the line represents the equilibrium point between two phases then can anybody point out one part of the diagram that might be of particular interest well if you said this point give yourself a gold star or pat on the back or kick up the ass or whatever um, this is an important point because right at this point here where we have this particular temperature of negative 56.4 degrees C and 5.11 atmospheres just over 75 pounds per square inch all three of these lines converge now what do you think that means well the name of that point it's got a very specific name it's called a triple point and some of you may have an idea why that's the case all right triple point can sometimes be abbreviated as T3 because um, a triple of course um, well, no, actually, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. Now, let me uh, rewind there, rewind there. So, we have a triple point. Um, and there's, there's a so-called triple point temperature. It's called T3. And then a triple point pressure, so-called P3. All right. And the important thing about this is, at that temperature and that pressure only, to the solid, the liquid, and the gas phases exist in equilibrium with each other okay this is not a very stable situation and it doesn't happen for long at all because obviously there's only one point where all three of them are at exactly the same place there so at that point all three phases are simultaneously existing in equilibrium with each other now is there another point on this diagram anywhere that most, some of you might want to have a that you might have a question about well maybe it's up at the end of the line here and that's where we're going to start talking about this supercritical fluid now some of you may have heard of the term supercritical fluid before you may not remember the context but we will talk about that for every molecule that can exist as these three states it can exist as a supercritical fluid as well and there's a particular temperature and a particular pressure usually very high pressure 
and depending on the species, a high temperature, here it's not a high temperature because it's CO2, which, which, which uh, as a solid exists at a very low temperature. But see the dotted lines going up and meeting here? This is so-called the critical, sorry, that's the critical temperature, forget that. That's the critical pressure, so-called PC. And above that point, and why, why the line stops here, above this point, um, it's no longer possible to discern between the liquid and the gas phase. They kind of mesh together. There are a bunch of videos on YouTube that you can look up and see um, about supercritical fluid in action. Um, some of them are a little easier to understand than others. I'm not going to put one on here. Uh, but a supercritical fluid is essentially um, part, it has the properties of a liquid and a gas. It'll f it'll um, fill a space to occupy its whole volume like a gas, but it maintains the properties of a liquid. So as you would imagine, it's not stable at all. Um, and so you'll only see it under very high pressure, and so you need specialized equipment to be able to generate that. Now, the use of a supercritical fluid, uh, it actually does have an application. Some of you may have heard this before. Um, dry ice, supercritical dry ice, uh, dry ice is used to remove caffeine from coffee beans. Okay, I used to use organic solvents, and that was not a healthy way to do it at all or safe way to do it. And uh, currently the method is the coffee beans are ground in a some sort of container. So let's say these are our coffee beans. And then also into there is placed some uh, carbon dioxide. There we go. So the system is sealed up and it's built in such a way as to withstand an awful lot of pressure in here. So what happens is as the uh, as the carbon dioxide in here has its pressure increased, it turns supercritical. And when it does that, adopting the properties of both a liquid and a gas, because dr because CO2 can um, dissolve uh, caffeine, it'll do that and pick up the caffeine from the coffee. Okay, and once that's all been picked up after a certain amount of time, the pressure is slowly released. This turns back into a gas and it takes the caffeine with it as it turns back into a gas. And so the caffeine is no longer in the coffee beans and the um, caffeine goes up out of here and then you remove the caffeine from wherever the uh, CO2 ends up. So anyway, anyway, that's just an application. The fact is this is how um, phase diagrams work. They're not all that difficult to understand. They just look very imposing and they're really not. Okay. Uh, so there we go. Phase diagrams. Thank you.